Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Catholic Feedback. Once again, it's good to be with all of you. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith to everyday life. And this is sort of a a, uh, revisiting of the very first episode of Catholic Feedback, at least part of it anyway, where we talked about the issue of purgatory, which is one of the things that was the hardest for me when I was struggling with coming into the Catholic faith. People say, well, was it the Virgin Mary? Was it the Pope? No, it was this one. Purgatory was tough for me. Um, And we'll talk about this a little bit, but we're going to jump in today and talk about this with the man who I would say is probably the most um, widely read guy on purgatory, at least these days, uh, from Catholic Answers. And this is his third time on our podcast, so he's becoming a regular guest here. I'm I'm joined today by Catholic Answers staff apologist, author, and just overall Smart guy, Mr. Carlo Broussard. Carlo, welcome back to Catholic Feedback, my friend. Keith, thanks for having me, brother. It's great oh, dude, to be it's great to you. be. It's great to be with you again. Here, I'm going to do this. Boom, we get a little close so we can they can see our beautiful faces, right? Um, <laughs> you like my pretty hair, man? You I like, like my it. hair, dude. <laughs> I, I, I like it. That's that's cool, man. That's cool. I ain't got that slick back hair like you got, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Here's the deal. When you're five foot seven and you know, you have to do whatever you can do. So like if I was like, a, you know, I'm a short man myself, brother. So I know the I, feeling. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have to just hit what's pitched to you sometimes in life. Right. And for now That's I've right. got, I've got some hair. So I, I, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know how we got started talking about that, but, um, you know, the, the deal is since I've been Catholic and I've, interacted with lots of people just like you have this whole issue of purgatory seems to be the issue that protestants struggle with the most and i can understand why because i walked through it but yeah. from your perspective as a catholic apologist and i'm sure that you know people have asked you about it do you still get that vibe that this is something people continue to struggle with absolutely that's why i wrote my book purgatory is for real great At book the by time, the way yeah Thanks, man. At the time, you know, practically speaking, we did not have a book on purgatory in our catalog. So that was like a hole in our catalog. And they were like, we need to fill this hole. But the reason why we needed to fill the hole was because at the time, and from my understanding, I think it's probably the same to this day, purgatory was the number one search topic on our website at catholic.com. Was it really? It's probably me. I apologize. (laughs) You justified my book, bro. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it probably was. And so, and so it was ranked number one. And uh, you would think that that topic is a dead horse that's being beaten over and over and over again, right? Because it's one of those topics that's always at the heart of the conversation in the Catholic Protestant dialogue. And here at Catholic Answers, we've been dealing with that issue for many years. Mm. And you would be, you would think that is it's it's done and over. But that horse is alive and kicking, Keith, and it still weighs heavy on the hearts and minds of folks. Precisely because I think for many Protestants, they've simply never come across a Catholic articulation of the doctrine of purgatory and the evidence for it, like we've been giving over the years here at Catholic Answers. I mean, not everybody knows about Catholic Answers. And so thus, not everybody knows the type of articulation that we're able to give both biblically and historically, and even according to reason, concerning the doctrine of purgatory. So for many people for whom it weighs heavy on their heart and mind, when they come to come across the type of articulations that we can give for purgatory, it's impactful for them. I'll never forget this, brother. I remember when I was just getting started in apologetics. I was working cash auditing at some convenience stores down in Louisiana. And I remember I was behind the counter counting the cash. And I heard this guy at the counter and some, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said something 
that let me know he was a Christian. And I was mm -hmm. wild and crazy at the time, man. I was like talking to everybody about Jesus and the Catholic faith and no fear, right? So I jumped over the counter, ran this guy down in the parking lot, and I just thanked him, like, brother, thank you for witnessing the Jesus, you know, because he had said something to the clerk. And man, the first thing he says was, so where do you go to church? Oh, boy, my, my chest buffed up. You know, at the time it was St. Michael's Catholic Church, you know. <laughs> and the first thing he said in response, well, what's this business about purgatory? Like of all the things he could have said right there in the parking lot, dude. He mentions he brings up purgatory. So it definitely weighs heavy on the hearts and minds of many Protestant Christians. I, I think it is. I think there's two reasons behind that. And I want to hear your thoughts on this. But I think the first reason is because it seems to really cut at the heart of what a lot of, of Protestant theology believes about the gospel. That when you're forgiven by Christ that your sins are separated from you as far as the East is from the West, that God forgets about them, that there's literally, like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And there right. seems to be this idea that in purgatory, our sins aren't really forgiven by God, that we have to, because we have to suffer for them, that there's something not finished, that there's that the, the, the work of Christ on the cross is insufficient for yeah. salvation. And I think that, I mean... That to a lot of people, and I know for me, that was my biggest hang up because I felt like it was a direct attack on the atonement and on the gospel itself. Yeah. And so it was hard for me. It wasn't just a question of, well, can you find this in the Bible or not in the Bible? Like it seemed because, yeah. you know, a lot of Catholic doctrines, the biggest problem people have is they go, well, I don't find that in the Bible, but it doesn't necessarily contradict what the Bible says, right? Yeah. Whereas this one to me seemed at the time to contradict something so foundational as the gospel. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, how do you answer that, that objection when people bring it to you? Yeah, I think you're right, Keith. That is the number one objection that purgatory seems to be a doctrine that undermines the sufficiency of Jesus's death on the cross, taking away from what he did on the cross. Now, the first response is that we have to clarify that if the issue is, if the sticking point is salvation, purgatory doesn't have anything to do with attaining our final salvation in the sense of being saved, because purgatory only has to do with getting rid of any impediments that impede us from immediately receiving our final salvation. So all souls in purgatory, they're guaranteed salvation. Salvation yeah. is eternally secure. And so nothing that takes place in purgatory contributes in any way to having to attain salvation. It's only getting rid of those things that's keeping you from immediately entering into it, you know, from the gift that's already given to you in a secure way. So if the problem is that, well, purgatory entails that Jesus's death on the cross is not sufficient to save us, that's just manifesting a misconception right. of what purgatory is. Now, it may very well be, and it often is the case, that the problem has to do with the idea of punishment or suffering that is due for sins, and that aspect of the doctrine of purgatory is often seen to be undermining what Jesus did. Because if you're operating on the assumption that Jesus's death on the cross took away all punishment due for my sin at the moment I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior and thus are initially saved, and that Jesus's death on the cross takes away all forthcoming punishment that could possibly incur for my sin that I may commit later in my Christian life, right? If that's the assumption, well then sure, purgatory is going to be an affront to Jesus's death on the cross. But Keith, the question is, what is the order of divine revelation? What is, this, what is the order of providence that has been revealed to us in a divine way? As Catholics, we affirm and believe 100% that Jesus' death on the cross is powerful and sufficient enough to take away every single kind of punishment due for sin, both temporary, temporal punishment, 
and eternal punishment. And in fact, Keith, we profess that when we're initially saved, ordinarily through the sacrament of baptism, all punishment due for past sin is entirely remitted by the application of the merits of Jesus' death on the cross. So it's not a matter of whether we believe Jesus' death on the cross is not powerful enough. That's not the issue. We affirm it is powerful enough to take it away. And we would even say it's at least possible that Jesus could, God could have willed an order of providence where Jesus' death on the cross 2,000 years ago would take away or would make it be such that I would no longer incur any punishment for sin whatsoever, even for sins committed in the future. We confess and believe that that's possible. God could have ordered it that way. But the question is, did he? So I would answer no. And this is what I do in my book, Purgatory is for Real. What we see from the data of divine revelation, Keith, is that God has set it up in such a way that for a justified Christian, somebody who's born again and initially saved, they still incur a debt of punishment due for sin. Even if it's not eternal, still a temporal punishment. And basically what that means is that there's some suffering due to the Christian for the sins that are being committed. And it is a part of divine revelation, as I argue, as we see in Scripture, that that debt of punishment is a reality. That's something that a justified Christian still can incur from sins that are committed, even if one repents of that sin. So for example, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, the author of Hebrew tells us that the Lord God disciplines every son of his, there in verse 5, and in verse 6, chastises every son of his. So notice, we're talking about the sons of God. We're talking about justified Christians. And the author, the inspired author, tells us that God disciplines his justified Christians, his sons, chastises justified Christians. Well, both of the Greek words that are used for those two words in verses 5 and 6 have the connotation of imposing punishment. So notice the inspired author teaches us that God punishes even justified Christians. Now, the only way that God could impose punishment on Christians who are already justified is if those Christians have a debt of punishment. Otherwise, God would be a cruel God, right? Yeah. There must be some punishment that is rightfully due to the Christian who is justified. Now, that punishment can't be eternal punishment. Because we're talking about sons of God. We're talking about right. Christians who are justified. Like they're in relationship with God. So the punishment is not an eternal punishment. So it can only be a temporal punishment that's due to the justified Christian. So here what, here's what we find in conclusion. From the data of sacred scripture, we see that it belongs to God's order of providence. That even though a person can have all of their debt of punishment for sin remitted initially when they come into Christ, it is still the case that God has will that if sins are committed after that initial phase of justification, there is still a debt of punishment incurred, even a temporal debt of punishment incurred for the sins that are forgiven, even for the justified Christian. So for us as Catholics, we're simply saying, Hey, if that debt of temporal punishment, like the suffering that's due to the individual, is not taken care of in this life, if the chastisement or the discipline is not complete by the end of this life for the Son of God, the justified Christian, it's simply going to be completed in the next life. We call it purgatory. And this final purification before the Son of God, the Christian, enters into the beatific vision, which we call heaven. Wow. Okay. So you hit a lot of things that I think are really important there. But you started with this idea that the objection I had has to do with misconception. And a lot yeah. of people have misconceptions. So let's just talk about some of those misconceptions that that Protestants and even some Catholics may have. Because I think there's two, I think there are different ones. I think there are Catholics that have some misconceptions too about purgatory um, that I hear anyway. Yeah. But the first one that you mentioned was that that purgatory is um, you know, a place where you can suffer for sins because Christ's suffering was insufficient. You you talked about how that's no that's not a, that's not at all what it is because 
everyone who enters purgatory, and this is the second misconception, is already judged to be saved. So purgatory is not a second chance. That's one That's big correct. misconception, is it? Absolutely. It's not a second chance for salvation, nor does purgatory have to do with attaining salvation because salvation is already guaranteed for the souls in purgatory. It only has to do with getting rid of the impediments that's impeding me from immediately possessing the gift that's already secure for me. So whereas yeah. in this life, the Catholic understanding is that our eternal reward is conditional on condition that I remain faithful to Christ, hold fast to the confession in Christ and die in friendship then I will receive the eternal reward. I'm not eternally secure with that final reward of eternal life. I must persevere into the end and die in friendship with Jesus. The souls in purgatory are the souls of those who have died in friendship with Jesus. So the eternal, eternal life is guaranteed to them. And so it's not a second chance for attaining salvation because it doesn't even have to do with attaining salvation. It only has to do with taking care of any remnants of sin that's impeding the soul from immediately entering into the beatific vision. So two misconceptions there. It's a second chance, and it's having to do with being saved. No, the souls in, the souls in purgatory are already saved in the sense of dying in friendship with Jesus and being guaranteed the eternal reward of eternal life in the beatific vision. Let's talk about some other misconceptions that you hear people dealing with when it, when it comes to purgatory. What, what else do you hear out there? Well, you, I mean, the misconceptions often, often, I don't know if there would be misconceptions, uh, but people often talk about the purgatorial fire, right? Mm. And the suffering of purgatory. Now, the church, the reason why I say it's not really a misconception is because the church hasn't given us any sort of definitive teaching upon the nature of the suffering yeah. or the intensity of the suffering, so, nor the purgatorial fire that's mentioned in scripture and in the early church fathers. So some will think it's a corporeal fire and some will be bothered by that. And that's not necessarily a misconception because the church doesn't have a definitive teaching, but it's important. It's a misconception insofar as people think we must believe that. Right. right? So if a person thinks purgatory, you got to believe in purgatorial fire, that's a misconception because the church doesn't teach that there's a purgatorial fire. A Catholic is permitted to believe that, but a Catholic is not required to believe that. Uh, also, many people have this conception of purgatory as being nothing but intense suffering. Like the suffering is so intense, it's just a little bit above hell, right? It's everything that hell is except being eternal or everlasting. Well, for those who think that, that's a misconception. Why? Because although there is intense suffering in purgatory, there are also many joys of purgatory that would make it be such that it's not just a little bit above hell. It's not hell except being everlasting, right? There yeah. are joys in purgatory that the soul experiences that go beyond what we can possibly experience in this life. One being that absolute certitude that heaven is theirs that they're going to get the beatific vision once the remnants of sin are purged, right? And all that defilement is taken care of. Heaven is there. That's something we cannot have, at least from the Catholic view. That's not something that we can have in this life, in absolute certitude, like without a doubt, without error. We could have a moral certainty, but not absolutely. So that would be yet another misconception, right? That purgatory is all negative and no joys. That's a misconception because there are joys in purgatory. That, that is interesting. Okay, so I want to just like, as we're talking about min misconceptions, I pulled up the, what the catechism says about purgatory. Yeah. And what, what surprised me about this, Carlo, is how little it actually says about it. Sure. Um, you know, and of course, the catechism represents the official teaching of the church. This isn't everything that visionaries or saints or theologians right. have said in speculation or in private revelation. This is what every Catholic must believe. And I'm going to read this, okay? And this is from paragraph 1030 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it says this, all who die in God's grace and friendship. OK, so that means you're saved, Absolutely. but still but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. 
The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Absolutely. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. And then there's there's different kind of justification for the teaching and where it came from. But that's it. That's what it says. Yeah. It doesn't say souls in purgatory are tortured with the with hellfire for nine billion years right. or anything like that. It like yeah. that's remarkably little and i feel like it has more to do with the function of purgatory rather than the nature of what it is itself yeah i mean purgatory is basically this final purification it's a yeah. state of existence right, right. A, the soul is existing in the afterlife without the beatific vision but not being eternally damned so it's neither heaven nor hell uh so it's a state of ex a spiritual state of existence it's a reality where, where in which the soul is undergoing this purification. Now, even though that paragraph is very short and there's very little said about it in this formalized way, once you begin to unpack that, there's a heck of a lot that is grounding what the catechism is saying just in a few yeah. sentences there, because there are a variety of different Catholic doctrines that are intertwined with one another that come into play, leading us to this very succinct, summarized formulation or conclusion about the doctrine of purgatory. It goes on there in paragraph 1030, 1032, 1031, 1032, to talk about praying for the dead, right? Yep, I'm looking at it so right now. So that's yeah. an essential aspect as well of purgatory, namely that the souls who are undergoing the final purification can be assisted by the faithful here on earth. So that's yet another element that goes into play here. And then in paragraph 1472, later on the catechism identifies at least one of the things that's going to be taken care of in the final purification, namely unhealthy attachments to creaturely goods, which is a remnant of sin. Whenever yeah. we sin, we not only incur a guilt of sin, but we also incur these unhealthy attachments, these wounds in the soul that are inclining us to pursue these creaturely goods in disordered ways, those unhealthy inclinations or attachments, that's going to begin taken care of in the final purification as well, along with what is normally called that debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin, right? Whatever temporary yeah. suffering that's due to the soul for the sin that was committed and the pleasure that was taken in the sin, when pleasure ought not to have been taken in the sin, where there should have been displeasure associated with the sinful behavior. Yeah. And so basically, even in this life, when God chastises his children, whenever we punish our children, whenever the father punishes us, it's basically reordering what was disordered. The proper order is pleasure, good behavior, displeasure, bad behavior. That's proper order. But whenever we sin, we mess things up. It's a disordered uh, paradigm where we're experiencing pleasure with bad behavior. So what does yeah. punishment do? It reorders it. It brings the order back into play where displeasure is associated with the bad behavior. That's what we do when we punish our children. That's what the father does when he punishes us here on earth. And of course, if there is a need for a finalization, right, of the in purgatory, that's going to happen in purgatory where there's this displeasure due to the soul that's going to be given to the soul in order to associate the displeasure with the bad behavior. And the soul will rejoice in that. Yet another source of joy. Because Amen. the soul is going to have this keen insight in God's providential plan and wisdom. And, and seeing the justice in associating the displeasure with the bad behavior, the soul is going to rejoice. Because that's manifesting God's divine goodness and justice. Amen. Amen. So yeah, that your mention of the Hebrews text, and I want to, in a couple minutes, I want to talk about the scriptural foundations of purgatory because it's there, you know, people are like, Oh, where's yeah. that in the Bible? But there's a, there's more than you might think, but yeah. that whole idea of, well, if you're forgiven by Jesus, you're just separated from all sin. Like Hebrews blows that up because Absolutely. how else do we, how else do we reference that text about God? Why does God need to punish us if, if our sins are all forgiven, right? And I don't know if you're, oh, well, he does it to correct us. But like you said, and I thought it was a great point, Carlo, like if if he doesn't just arbitrarily punish us for no reason, 
Right. That, there that's, has to be a proportion, there has right? There to be something. Yeah. So yeah. otherwise it's, you know, cause there's a difference I think between just random acts of, of discipline or punishment for no reason versus like actual discipline, which is corrective, you know, and, and, and yeah, the telos, I, the goal of discipline is indeed our sanctification and holiness. Yeah. And the author of Hebrews actually points that out. In verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 12, he says that very same thing, that the, the very goal of the chastisement is sanctification. But appealing to the goal of the discipline yeah. does not take away from the fact that there needs to be a corresponding crime that merits the punishment or the discipline. There must be some legitimate debt of punishment that is due to the individual in order for the punishment to be just, which in turn brings about our correction and sanctification, the manifestation of God's divine glory. Otherwise it's, you know, and I, I want to distinguish between that and all forms of suffering because not all forms of suffering are, are punishments punishment. from God. Absolutely. Because I'm thinking about like a victim soul or, or saints who, who volunteer to suffer. And they, like, that's different than what we're talking about here. That's different from what the yeah. text is talking about, but you can't deny the fact that the scriptures do speak of God chastising those whom he loves. And he says, it's a product of love. It's not God's just so mad. He's got to get you. It's this right. is part of the loving process. And I, I feel like, Ultimately, what we're going to discover is when we really begin to consider what the church teaches and the and the reasoning behind it and how it plays out, purgatory is actually a mercy, an act of mercy on God's part. It's yeah. part of it's it's an it's a manifestation of His mercy because yeah. the truth is, like like Revelation tells us, no unclean thing can enter heaven. If if God, the moment we died, if we had some of that unhealthy attachment to sin, as you mentioned, in, like what the Catechism says. That we're worthy of hell just because of that. And and but but we are we are given this opportunity for purification, yeah, by the merits of Christ. So I think that's that's yeah. an incredible merciful thing. Yeah, let me uh respond to that. So I would nuance, I would clarify very briefly that the unhealthy attachment would not be damnable. So we wouldn't be worthy of hell in virtue of the unhealthy attachment but we would not be able to enter into the beatific vision. And this is where the mercy of God comes into play, Keith, and you're spot yeah. on, brother, precisely because God is not bound in justice to himself to purify us of the remnants of sin. He's not even bound to give us the grace of repentance. Yeah. Whenever we're able to repent, that's a grace. That's a pure gift, man. Nothing I've done to merit that. God gives us that as a free gift. Nor is God bound in justice to himself or to us to purify us of any remnants of sin that although might not be worthy of hell, are still impeding us from entering into the beatific vision. Well, thank you for that, that important clarification. That's that's a very I appreciate that. That's a very important yeah, nuance. Be yeah. Because we have to keep in mind that remember, all souls in purgatory are not subject to hell. They are dying in the friendship of Christ. Unhealthy attachments are not damnable, nor is venial sin damnable, right? And guilt of venial sin is something taken care of in final purification. But the point is this, Keith, G God could in just completely consistent with his own just with his justice and even with his justice to leave us in a state yeah. to where we have a minor defilement impeding us from entering into heaven, but not worthy of damnation. He could have, but yet according to the Catholic understanding of the doctrine of purgatory, he chose not to, he willed it such that for those who die in friendship with him, not worthy of damnation, but still can't enter immediately into heaven, he's going to purify them and get rid of these remnants of sin so that they can actually, for the rest of their existence, experience that perfect knowledge and love and the beatific vision. That, brother, is pure mercy. Amen. Because it is completely over and beyond what is due to the individual. And that's why purgatory is a manifestation of God's mercy. Amen. I love that. I love that. Let's let's talk for just a, a, a short while here about some of these other 
maybe I don't I don't know if I want to call them misconceptions, but maybe other beliefs that Catholics sometimes talk about yeah. with regard to purgatory that aren't necessarily part of divine revelation or or things that maybe we don't have to believe, but could be, I, I guess they could be true. So I guess we'll call that speculation maybe. Yeah. yeah um, theological speculation, which right. is fine. Like that's the other yeah. thing I think people don't always recognize is that it's okay to speculate about things that the church hasn't definitively said is one way or the other. And just because somebody does that doesn't necessarily, and they happen to be a saint or a doctor of the church or a theologian doesn't necessarily mean that it is 100% like on the money. Like there, there are yeah. opportunities for that. So let's now I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't have to listen to saints and stuff like that, obviously, but, but I think sometimes people go, Oh, but this particular saint said that yeah. if you do X, Y, Z, you can get X number of years off of, off of purgatory. Um, yeah. So people get real hung up on that stuff. Let's talk about some of those things that maybe Catholics say or do that may be true, but not necessarily. Yeah, well, getting back to what we said earlier, the idea of a corporeal fire, that's a matter of speculation. You have a strong theological tradition that there is a corporeal fire that by divine power in a miraculous way con contains the soul, impeding the soul from going about or being or acting where it wants to act. And that's a form of punishment, so these theologians will say. But that's pure speculation. That does not enter into official church teaching. So a Catholic is free to disagree with that strong theological tradition that many great minds have submitted. There's also the idea of the souls being within the, the, the bowels of the earth, that the souls are actually in purgatory detained in some geographical location within the physical cosmos. That's also a part of a strong theological tradition, but a Catholic is not obliged to believe that or accept it. A Catholic can completely disagree with that and still be in good, rightful standing with the Catholic Church. Another matter of speculation is the nature of the suffering, the intensity of the suffering. Like, is the suffering in purgatory way beyond and more what we could possibly experience in this life? Well, theologians are all over the board on that. Some theologians will say, absolutely, any suffering in purgatory is far beyond what we could possibly imagine in this life. Other theologians will say, well, there might be some suffering in purgatory that's way more intense than what we could possibly experience in this life, but there might be lesser forms of suffering, right, mm -hmm. in purgatory. Uh, so theologians differ in their opinions concerning the... Yeah intensity of the suffering, also the duration of the suffering. So the church has never defined whether the suffering is instantaneous or whether the suffering, there is a durational aspect to the suffering. So uh, a Catholic could still be in good standing and have some differing opinions on that, right? Now, it is true, I think, a strong arguments can be given from the theological tradition and the practice of the church and praying for the dead, that the church in her common practice has this sort of consciousness that there is a duration to the suffering for the souls in purgatory. Uh, but that's, again, that's not definitive teaching. So you have some theologians who would postulate the idea that all the souls in purgatory, the suffering that they experience, instantaneous. Some theologians might say, well, there could be some suffering that can be instantaneous for some souls, but for other souls who have more deeply rooted unhealthy attachments, more debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin, for those souls, their suffering is going to be, quote unquote, longer, however we measure time in the afterlife, right? Uh, so again, this is a matter of theological speculation to where Catholics can have differing opinions on these things because they go beyond the boundaries of official church teaching. Yeah. And I think that those, that's, that's good stuff to kind of, I guess, talk about and think about and consider, you know, but it, yeah, I don't it, know that it's good stuff to like build your entire no. theological framework around. Right. We know that there is a final purification. We know that there are some remnants of sin, not subject to death, not worthy of damnation that are taken care of in the soul. 
uh, but the precise details of what's going on there, uh, we speculate about. Another thing I point out in my book, Keith, Purgatory is for Real, that's up for speculation, is the uh, the nature of the the means by which the remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin is taken care of. So some theologians might say, well, that debt of temporal punishment, that suffering that's due to the soul, that's taken care of whenever the unhealthy attachments are mm. purified, right? And the catechism seems to go in this direction, affirming that the purging of the unhealthy attachment, that's what we call temporal punishment, okay? But the question becomes, is that the only way that God has taken care of the remaining debt of temporal punishment, namely purging the unhealthy attachments? Or does he also take care of the remaining debt of temporal punishment by imposing some form of suffering upon the soul separate from, independent from, alongside with, the purging of the unhealthy attachments. So you see how mm, there can yeah. be two differing views there. So traditionally, the magisterium seems to, uh, to seems to really emphasize this imposition of suffering that's distinct from the purging of the unhealthy attachments. Mm -hmm. But then you have the modern magisterium and the catechism kind of distancing itself in some way from this separate imposition of suffering and just highlighting the purging of the unhealthy attachments as the means, as a means in virtue of which we can discharge the debt of temporal punishment. So that's an interesting theological, yeah, it's a lot. It's very in the weeds there for your, any of your viewers and listeners who are theologically minded. That's some interesting, cool stuff to think about. As I point out in my book, Purgatory is for Real. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of Catholics <clears throat> get, you know, we hear things about purgatory. I'm thinking about Marian apparitions or different things where you talk about, like I know in Fatima, she says that the one girl's friend or relative is in purgatory until the end of the world or something like yeah. that. So you can hear things right. like that and you go, okay, well there, you know, there's this time. And we just prayed the yesterday after, you know, when we recorded, this was the feast of St. Gertrude, the great. So we pray that prayer. It's supposed to get a thousand yeah. souls out of purgatory. Every time <laughs> you pray it. I mean, and I think those are good things. I mean, I don't, I don't want to yeah. be like, no, no, no. But at the same time, I also think it's important to, to recognize that the part of our faith that allows for some space in, yeah. in the things that we think about. And, and that's, and that's important. Again, it's not to argue one way or the other. I know there will be some people that will be uh, upset about the fact that anybody might not look at it a certain way, but that's kind of the beauty of the magisterium, isn't it? That yeah. not only does the magisterium tell us what we need to believe, but it also tells us, the areas where we're free to have different Play ideas and, yeah. and, and, and it's okay. We, we're not, we don't have to expect to understand and know every little detail about everything and Absolutely. still be Catholic. Like to me, that's a part of it, but yeah, pretend for a second, you know, and I could put this hat on pretty easily that I'm, I'm like a Protestant dude who's like, Carlo, look, I'm a Bible believing Christian, man. Right. And all this purgatory stuff, like I just can't see any of this in scripture so where, what are the, now that we've defined what it is and what it isn't, where do you find the, the greatest source of scriptural foundation for these beliefs? Yeah, well, I have a couple of chapters answering that very question. Uh, one of the chapters is looking at St. Paul's theology in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. There, Paul is talking about those who build on the foundation of Jesus. So he's talking about justified Christians. These are not people who are subject to damnation. These are people who are saved, building on the foundation of Jesus. And he goes on to talk about how the day will disclose whatever works that these individuals have performed in building on the foundation of Jesus. Some of the works will be represent, are represented by um, gold, silver and precious stones. But there are other works, Paul lists, that are metaphorically represented by wood, hay, and stubble. All of which, those works, Paul says, will be burned up in fire. Hence so the fire the, representation. <laughs> that's yeah. right. So he's talking about the day. For Paul, the day is the day of judgment. And the day of judgment 
Hebrews 9.27, other passages, comes after death. So Paul is talking about a post-mortem state of existence. And he's talking about how on that day of judgment, as we stand before the refining fire of God, right? The works of the individual who've built upon the foundation of Christ will be manifest. Some of those works, if they be rep if they be not so good, wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to be burned up in the fire. And Paul goes on, Keith, to say that the individual will suffer loss on account of those bad works. So there is suffering on account of the bad works. That's a form of punishment. Like Amen. that maps on very mm -hmm. much with the idea of punishment. However you look at it, suffering on account of bad deeds, that's punishment, man. However you parse it out and the precise nature in which the, put, the suffering is bestowed, doesn't matter. There is suffering here on account of not mortal sin, but on account of venial sin. Because remember, these are bad works that are performed by the Christian who's building on the foundation of Jesus. So he's saved. Then, furthermore, Paul goes on to say, even though he's going to suffer loss on account of these bad works, he shall be saved, but only as through fire. And the way Paul describes that there is as if the fire is a means in virtue of which mm. the individual is being saved. So if we're talking about a postmortem state of existence where a saved individual is suffering on account of past forgiven, past uh, venial sins, it can't be heaven because there are there is no suffering in heaven, nor is there any purging of sins going on in heaven, nor can this postmortem state of existence be hell, Keith, because as again, Paul is describing the individual as one who builds on the foundation of Jesus and will be saved. And so if this is a postmortem state of existence, that's neither heaven nor hell, where the individual is seemingly undergoing some form of purification in light of the metaphor of the fire, this is a final purification before the individual goes into heaven, neither heaven nor hell. What do we call it? We call it purgatory. Boom. I mean, I remember <laughs> as a Protestant looking at that text and not quite knowing what to make of it, still believing like, oh, no, Catholics are wrong about purgatory. But what do we do with this? Because everything you said, you just broke it down. I mean... It is what it is, what you just described. And it's hard to get around because, again, the yeah. fact that the Catholic Church has not placed these strong, you know, um, definitions around purgatory, but just it's the state of being, the state of this judgment, right? And the, here's the function yeah. of it. What if you ask if you ask somebody to describe what that is, even if they're not a Catholic, what they're going to describe, you go, Yep, that's purgatory. Right. And uh, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Are there any others that you that you look to? Any other texts besides yeah, the so, one? I know the one in Maccabees about praying for the dead. Yeah. Let's let's just skip that for now because the Protestant isn't going to accept that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do have a chapter with regard to Jesus's teaching on mm -hmm. purgatory, and I look at two passages there. One of which is Matthew twelve thirty two. The other of which is Matthew five twenty five through twenty six. So Matthew 12, 32, that's where our Lord talks about the sin against the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Will not be forgiven in this age, nor in the age to come. And I give lines of argumentation to suggest that the age to come is a reference to the afterlife. And so for our Lord to say that this particular sin will not be forgiven in this age, nor in the age to come, the implication is that there are some sins that can be forgiven in the age to come, in the afterlife. And this makes perfect sense, Keith, as to why our Lord would add this extra tidbit, because he could have just said, the sin against the Holy Spirit is never forgiven. And that's actually how Mark records Jesus' teaching there. But Matthew adds this extra tidbit in Jesus' teaching, that this particular sin, sin against the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven in this, in this age, nor in the age to come. Now, why would Matthew want to include that extra tidbit of information? Because his audience, the Jewish audience, they prayed for would, the dead. Yep. Yeah, they would have been asking the question, okay, Lord, you're telling us the sin can't be forgiven in this age, but what about in the age to come? Because they believed some sins could be remitted 
in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And this is where second Maccabees 12 comes into play. Even though you don't accept it as somebody might not accept it as inspired second Maccabees chapter 12, where Judas Maccabeus and his soldiers pray for their fallen comrades, that their sins might be remitted provides a historical backdrop for the first century Jewish audience to whom Jesus is speaking. So they would have been asking that question. Well, okay, can this sin be for, maybe it can't be forgiven in this age, Jesus, but could it be forgiven in the afterlife? Like these other sins we believe can be forgiven. And Jesus says, no. And so here we have Jesus talking about sins, it, the implication being that sins can be forgiven in the afterlife. Well, if sins can be forgiven in the afterlife, that surely cannot be a state of existence that's heaven nor hell. So what is it? We yeah. call it purgatory. At least that's one aspect of the doctrine of purgatory being affirmed by our Lord. And then in Matthew 5, 25 through 26, that's where he talks about how if uh, you will be thrown by the judge into prison and you will not get out until you pay the last chondrantes the last penny or the last farthing, Condrantes being less than 2% of a day's wage. And whenever, as I point out in my book, whenever we unpack that passage, we have very good reason to conclude that Jesus is referring to a post-mortem prison, mm -hmm. but a temporary post-mortem prison, as opposed to an everlasting post-mortem prison, which would be hell. And the details of that argumentation go a little bit beyond what we can talk about here yeah. in our conversation. But basically what I do is I draw a contrast between the prison that Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 25 through 26, and a similar type of prison that he describes in Matthew 18 about the unforgiving servant. And there are details in the narrative of Matthew 18 that give a clear indication that the prison in Matthew 18, in which the unforgiving servant is thrown and he will not get out until he pays all his debt, there are details in that narrative that suggest the prison is everlasting. But in Matthew 5, there are no details to suggest that the prison is an everlasting prison. And so given what our Lord says, he's going to be thrown in there until he pays the last penny, we can take that as it naturally reads that the debt is payable. Whereas in Matthew 18, we have details to suggest that we should read the prison to be everlasting. Not so in Matthew 5. Hmm. Wow, interesting. So with regard to purgatory and the Reformation, I want to ask you about this a little bit because the narrative is often that Martin Luther, he challenges the church. And I, know, I know we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of the Reformation completely, but... yeah. That the the accusation is often made that this is that what Martin Luther is doing is he's challenging a novel teaching uh, that that came about in the Middle Ages and and he's basically saying this whole thing is just made up and I'm going to try to get everybody on track. Like, what role do you think the idea of purgatory itself versus just like indulgences? Do you feel like that played a huge role in the Reformation? Was Martin Luther challenging all of that just in and of itself, or, or was, was this something greater than that? No, Luther actually initially did not challenge the doctrine of purgatory. In fact, I'll share a few quotes with you in a yeah. minute here. He affirmed it. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, what his problem was was the abuses mm -hmm. of the selling of indulgences which naturally is tied to the doctrine of purgatory, given the doctrine of indulgences. But he his problem, rightfully so, was with regard to the corruption present among church leaders at the time and the abuse of indulgences. Yeah. Because almsgiving was a way by which you could take care of some of that debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin. Given that reality many church leaders began to abuse that doctrine, using it for their own financial benefit. And that's what Luther had a problem with, not purgatory. So for example, in his 95 Thesis in 1517, Luther wrote this, the Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory, not by the power of the keys, which we would disagree with, uh, which he does not have, but by way of intercession for them. Actually, Actually, I, I'll retract that. Luther's right here because 
the church does not have direct jurisdiction over the souls in purgatory. So whenever the church is, uh, whenever the church allows for us to gain an indulgence for a soul in purgatory, that's simply by way of intercession. Indulgences applied to us is an exercise of the power of the keys by the church. So Luther is correct here, but notice that he's affirming the reality of purgatory here. Also, in uh, his work a few years later, in his work entitled Defense and Explanation of All the Articles in 1521, here's what he said. The existence of a purgatory I have never denied. I still hold that it exists, right? Although, he says, I found no way of proving it incontro incontrovertibly from Scripture or reason. So he affirms its existence. You're blowing my mind, dude. I didn't know that. Like I've, yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been in the in the thick of this for years, and I did not know what you just said. Yeah, yeah. What he had a problem that with unremarkable that, I, or not that it's that remarkable. <laughs> There's stuff I don't know. I don't mean to come off like yeah. that, but that yeah. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You would think, right? You would think that he he would initially have denied it, and that would have been sort of at the heart of the Reformation debates. But it wasn't. Yeah. What he had a problem with was whether or not it could be proved from scripture. Wow. And in fact, the church would respond and say, oh yes, it can, <laughs> right? The church affirms that scripture can be used as a foundation for purgatory. So it was not a matter of whether it existed. It was hmm. a matter, matter of how we can prove it. Did now, he ever change his mind later? Absolutely. Okay. He did change it. So in 1537. <laughs> Sorry, you, you were about to say that. I just jumped the gun. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Here's what he says, brother. Check this out. Therefore, purgatory and every solemnity, right, and commerce connected with it. All right. So you'd be talking about the selling of indulgences. But notice he includes purgatory itself here. Is to be regarded as nothing but a specter of the devil. Mm. For it conflicts with the chief article that only Christ and not the works of men are to help set free souls. Not to mention the fact that nothing has been divinely commanded or enjoined upon us concerning the dead. So notice... Here in 1537, he totally reverses his position, calling the doctrine of purgatory a specter of the devil. So isn't it interesting, Keith? Here's this reformer, the one who initiates the Protestant Reformation, denying the Pope of any sort of authority and infallibility, etc., and setting himself up as an authority to preach upon matters of divine revelation, and yet he's going to flip-flop concerning yep. this, uh, this doctrine, saying it is real, and then saying it comes from the devil. Well, why should we trust him in whatever else he says if he's going to change what he teaches? That's powerful. Man, I didn't know that. That's incredible. I'm going to use that. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, I cite it in the book. So if your yeah, viewers yeah. are interested, get Purgatory is for Real, and it's right yeah. there. I must have missed that part of it because I, 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 didn't, I didn't catch that because I would have, that, that blew my mind. That blew my mind. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I want to, we just have a couple minutes left, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But I, I do want to ask this question because I know a lot of Catholics are like, all right, Keith, listen, we get it. We, we believe in Purgatory. We understand that. But we have a strong desire, and we do this on the Rosary Crew, like our, our Rosary pro, um, live stream that we do every day, especially on Fridays. We pray and offer up our petitions for the holy souls in purgatory. We do that. And that's very important to, to so many people. And I know that, like for me, when I learned about that this has been a practice since even before Jesus, right, that the Jews prayed for their dead, the early church prayed for their dead, There's there was... There, there's a, a long history of that, obviously, which leads to the question of what can Catholics do now for the souls in purgatory? Like, what are we supposed to be doing? What can we do? And is it effective? Yeah. Well, with regard to the question of what can you do, you do exactly what you've been saying, praying a rosary for the holy souls in purgatory, offering up a simple prayer like, Lord, I want to pray for the holy souls in purgatory. Please bring to an end the final purification of my uh, the soul of my loved one if the soul of my loved one is still in purgatory. It can be a simple prayer like that. Like, come on, Lord, <laughs> bring their final purification to an end, right? Pray for the repose of the souls. May the souls of the favor departed through the mercy of God rest in peace, right? Mm -hmm. That's the prayer we pray after like the blessing prayer for meals. <laughs> but you don't have to just pray that prayer at meals. You can pray it at any time during the day. 
for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, offering up mass. So you go to the rectory, mm -hmm. you say, hey, I'd like to offer this mass for this the soul of my loved one who passed a year ago or so. So offering up the mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is a way that we can intercede on behalf of of the souls in purgatory, offering up any suffering that you're undergoing. Yeah. Whether that be involuntary suffering, like there's just something that happens to you. I got a headache today. Uh, I don't know. I got in a car wreck or I'm paralyzed or whatever the suffering may be from the most mundane suffering of I got a sore throat to a severe suffering of being paralyzed or something. We can offer that suffering up for the holy souls in purgatory, for a specific soul or just the souls in general. So offering our sufferings up or imposing some form of displeasure upon ourselves voluntarily for the sake of the souls in purgatory. So, so fasting the, or, or... That's right, yeah, some you know, sort of penitential... Sleeping on the floor, taking a cold shower, like those kind of things. Yeah, not putting sugar in your coffee or something, drinking black coffee. <laughs> it could be as simple suffering. as that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and now with regard to your second question, is it effective? The church says yes. So this is a part of official infallible teaching of the church concerning the doctrine of purgatory that our prayers and suffrages for the souls in purgatory is beneficial, is effective. We can literally affect them in their final purification, wow. either partially uh, limiting their final purification weakening the intensity of the suffering or bringing it to a completion. That's awesome. That's awesome. Something to be, something to be thinking about, you know, my mom passed away um, five, six years ago now, man, it's been that long. And I remember when I was right was the time I was becoming Catholic. And I remember feeling like, you know, up until that point in my life, when someone's, when someone had passed away, there was really nothing you could do. And in terms of for them anymore. And I remember coming into the church in November, you know, the month of soul, where we think about the souls and, and they had the no the notebook they brought out this yeah. like book of the dead or whatever, where you would write your name in there for the person that you wanted prayers for. And people would actually do it. And then there was the whole issue of the, you know, the plenary indulgence you can receive on um, yeah. the octave of the, of all souls day or whatever. And that just brought incredible comfort to me. It still does to, to think about, those people who've been lost. And every day when we go to mass and we hear this mass is offered for this person, or we pray for those as part of our, our, the prayers of the people, you know, to pray for the souls who have died and to know that this isn't something that we just created out of nowhere to make our souls feel better. I, one of the things that the catechism talks about is that in reference to the book of Job, where he offers those sacrifices for his sons um, yeah. on their behalf. And I feel like sometimes you, you go through these periods of, I just want that person to to turn their life around. You feel hopeless, but to offer up those prayers for their conversion, for their souls, and ultimately, if they have passed on, that if they are in that place where they require purification, that we can help them in some way. It's it's a beautiful act of mercy, and it's something. It's a part of this whole thing that we're that we are connected as Catholics in the communion yeah. of saints. And I got one more question Absolutely. about that. Like I've, and I've heard both, I've heard answers on this from both ways. Maybe that's just one of those speculation things, but we pray for the souls in purgatory. Can they pray for us? Right. Cause I've heard people say sometimes like, can you, can, can they intercede on our, on our behalf or yeah. are they unable to do that? What do you think about that, Carlo? Yeah, I actually, I'm of the position that they can pray for us. So I argue for this in my book. Okay. And I, I think the catechism is pretty darn clear in paragraph 958. The little, the, the title of the paragraph is communion with the dead. So we're talking about the souls in purgatory here in full consciousness of this communion of the whole mystical body of Jesus Christ, the church and its pilgrim members from the very earliest days of the Christian religion has honored with great respect the memory of the dead. And because it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loose from their sins, she offers her suffrages for them. Here's the key phrase. Yeah. Our prayer for them is capable not only of helping them, but also of making their intercession for us effective. Boom. 
Yes. Now yeah. some will say, some will say, well, that, uh, that refers to when they get to when heaven, they get to heaven, right? Their prayer for us will be effective. But that's not what the catechism says, nor is there anything in this paragraph that would lend itself to that implication. It simply says our prayers for those souls in purgatory helps them and it makes their intercession for us effective. We're talking about souls in purgatory. We're not talking about the souls that are in heaven. And so I see this text as supporting the position that they can indeed pray for us, and they do. And I think it's, it, we can, as I point out in my book, we can further argue this based upon charity. It does not make sense that if we believe that the souls in purgatory are fixed in their charity, they have charity in their soul, they're in communion with Jesus, and charity involves loving others through intercessory prayer. True. And it makes perfect sense that they would be exercising their charity, loving us through praying for us. And I think the catechism supports that. I th well, I tell you what, I, I agree with you. I like that. But if I get to heaven and find out that it was different, I'll still think God was right. So um, <laughs> that's awesome. Carlo, what else? Is there anything else that we haven't covered yet that you think is so important for people to know about purgatory that are, that are maybe they're Protestant and they're, this has been the, the, defining objection of their lives and they can't get past it. Is there anything else that we haven't really covered yet that you would like to, to, to share with them? You know, Keith, I can't think of anything off the top of my head as to what would be that silver bullet that we haven't touched on yet. I think we've covered sort of the major issues that Me people too. would struggle with. Now there is, there is a lot more. And I will say this, that in the book, there's a lot more that can, uh, complement what we've said here in our short time together that creates sort of this cumulative case for the doctrine of purgatory that if one who's listening right now is not convinced yet by reading everything else that complements what we've said so far may very well tip the scale for them. So I would recommend they get a hold of my book, Purgatory is for Real, subtitle, good news about the afterlife for those who aren't perfect yet. And they can get that at shop.catholic.com. Amen. Of course, I'll link that down below. Uh, Carlo, once again, my friend, it's been awesome. I feel like like we have this little vibe going here. Like yeah, you've been absolutely. on here a lot. It's been awesome. I really, really, truly appreciate that. I know my, I know my, um, my viewers and listeners have appreciated this, uh, this trifecta of episodes here too. Uh, so I, I yeah, you know, thanks what again, man. You're welcome. One thought that came to mind, any listeners out there who want to bring both you and me to their parish to give a double speaking event, I think we would work well together. Oh, man, I know we would. I mean, <laughs> I, my brain's already moving on that direction now. That would be Absolutely. awesome. So, yeah, let's make that happen sometime. That would be Indeed. that would be awesome. Well, I'm sure at some point in time, you and I will cross paths in the flesh, and I look forward to then. Um, in the meantime, once again, Carl, thank you for your ministry at Catholic You're Answers, welcome. for the books you write and for the people that you speak with. And uh, for all that you do for the kingdom of God, friends, make sure you check out Carlo's uh, books. He's got a ton of them. I'll link to uh, Catholic Answers below, and and you know you guys can explore that stuff. But thank you all so much for watching this episode. And again, if you're struggling with this idea of purgatory, like like I did, and like so many of other, others have, but everything else in the Catholic Church is starting to make sense to you. Don't let this be the stumbling block. It is not an affront to the gospel. It does not diminish from the saving power of Jesus Christ. In a matter, of, in and in, as a matter of fact, as we talked about here, this is an act of mercy on God's part to get us ready to walk through those gates to be with Jesus. No unclean thing can enter into heaven. And just because we stop breathing on this life doesn't mean that our eternal soul has necessarily been completely purified and ready to go. So pur pur purgatory is just a place where we get cleaned up and get ready to walk in. You know, Jesus talks about what, going into the wedding feast with the proper garment. Purgatory is the place where you put that on, my friends, and and prepare. So so check it out. But once again, thank you guys all so much for watching this episode of Catholic Feedback. And I look forward to being back here with you next time. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. 
For more information about Down to Earth or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number 2 earthministry.org. See you next time.